Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to all of those who've just joined us now for this lecture, and uh, welcome back to all the colleagues who've been with us all day at the conference. We now move to our public lecture of this evening, and it's my delight to introduce our speaker. So Gaminda K. Bambra is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies in the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. While her research interests are primarily in the area of post-colonial and global historical sociology, she is also interested in the intersection of the social sciences more generally, with recent work in post-colonial and decolonial studies. And she's going to talk to us tonight about colonial histories, post-colonial societies, on the politics of selective memory in Europe. Thank you. Hello, and thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak to you here today, and thank you for coming along to hear what I have to say. And also a special thank you to the translators who do such an amazing job in enabling us to communicate across languages. So here I am and here we are in Warsaw, in the area of the Warsaw Ghetto. This morning I walked around for a while around the city and I came across one of the markers to the ghetto wall the wall that had divided people, the wall that had marked whether you stood a better chance of living or of dying. I'm here at Polin, the Museum of the History of Polish Jews, and I've been asked to respond to the question, who is Europe? What do I say? What can I say? It was a bright day, crisp, silence hung heavy in the air. She soaked and rinsed the dishes left over from breakfast. He dried them as he always had done. The banality of routine held together their shattered peace, however temporarily. She dried her hands and went and stood by the window. He leaned forward over the worktop. I don't know if I really saw what happened. We saw it, he said quietly, but we weren't close enough, we can't be sure. He walked over and put his hands on her shoulders. We need to work out what we're going to do. I'm tired of moving, I like it here. You liked it here, it's not the same. It'll pass, let's just stick it out. When is it too late to leave? Where's the line between being a startled rabbit or a skinned one? The thoughts expressed in this paper are prompted by the crisis for refugees within Europe and also by the fallout of the British vote to leave the European Union and the rise of the far right and fascism across the continent. They're prompted by the violence that comes in the wake of silencing histories that would better explain our shared past and how these silenced histories continue to configure our present and our sense of who we are configure or perhaps disfigure. The concepts we use in political debates matter. The shape of those concepts, that is the way in which they're configured in relation to particular histories and the silencing of other histories, they matter. They matter because in the process, people become bodies in or out of place, with the right to have rights or without any such claims being recognized. In the light of this, now, perhaps more than ever, the question of who is Europe and the related question of what Europe might stand for requires urgent address. In his work on European cosmopolitanism, Jürgen Habermas, one of the most prominent and respected commentators on the question of Europe, has stated, and I quote, that the universalist project of the political enlightenment in no way contradicts the particularist sensibilities of multiculturalism, provided that the latter is understood in the correct way. Of course, the proviso is precisely what is at issue. Who defines what is the correct way? Questions of diversity within Europe have standardly been dealt with in two ways. Multiculturalism, 
is used to refer to the visible difference of populations within states, whereas cosmopolitanism is used to refer both to the differences between states as well as an overarching commonality of culture. The European project, given institutional form first as the European Economic Community and then as the European Union, came about in its own understanding as a consequence of European states wishing to make amends for the recent past that had seen two world wars and the genocide perpetrated by the Nazi regime occur on European soil. The European project sought to create a common framework within which national differences could coexist without murderous intent. The Associated Intellectual Project was organized around the idea of cosmopolitan Europe, a Europe that would distance itself from its recent past by uniting in recognition of its deeper, long-standing commonalities and celebrating its cultural diversity within those commonalities. Diversity in this context, however, refers primarily to the linguistic and cultural diversity seen to exist within states, rather between states within the European Union. There is very little discussion of the diversity constituted by multicultural others within states as part of this same conceptualization of cosmopolitan Europe. And just in relation to an earlier paper today, it would be interesting to know whether the Museum of European History addresses Europe's multicultural past or only its cosmopolitan past. Such an articulation of cosmopolitanism as a specifically European phenomenon rests on a particular understanding of European history that evades acknowledging European domination over much of the world as significant to that history. It also disavows examining the consequences of that domination for the contemporary multicultural constitution of European societies, a constitution that those on the far right seeing as, see as having been imposed upon them as opposed to having been created out of their historical imposition upon others. Cosmopolitanism acknowledges national differences within a common European cultural framework and at the same time posits its European cultural difference from those non-European others that are associated with the diversity that is said to constitute multiculturalism. The cosmopolitan cultural diversity of Europe then is counterposed to that constituted by and through multicultural others who are presumed to import their diversity into and against the cultural diversity already present in Europe. And I'll say more about the particular consequences of this way of understanding difference in Europe subsequently. Going back to Habermas for a moment, I mean, he's one of the key intellectuals who's consistently sought to define the normative and political projects of Europe. One of the key questions for him has been how citizens within the European Union could be made to understand themselves as citizens of the European Union. This is presented by him as necessary for the establishment of a political culture that will subsequently enable political action by the European Union. He has expressed concerns about growing inequality within and across European states, and these concerns are accompanied by fears about the threats to social peace that are posed by the turn to right-wing populism. The problems of atavism associated with far-right activity within Europe are seen by him to be addressed through arguments for a stronger European Union. More Europe, not less Europe. This is done, however, without saying anything about the substance of the far right's hostility to multiculturalism, or their calls for reductions in immigration and the acceptance of asylum seekers and refugees. I think it's striking that over the last few years, the only public figure to speak openly on behalf of refugees and migrants has been the Pope. No secular intellectual has spoken out. Habermas's comments haven't gone much further than to assert that asylum is a human right, and hardly any of Europe's other mainstream public intellectuals have spoken out about the crisis for refugees or the accompanying increase in hostility towards migrants and those presented as multicultural other. Indeed, I don't know if you saw the papers yesterday, but Hillary Clinton was interviewed in The Guardian, and she argues that Europe needed to stop immigration in order to defeat the fascists. 
well, it's the fascists who wish to stop immigration. So if we stop immigration to stop the fascists, what does that make us? In the same way as anti-Semitism didn't end in Europe after the 1940s, racism and anti-immigrant feeling is not going to be ended by getting rid of black and brown people. This generalized silence on the moral crisis facing Europe is not, I suggest, an individual lapse but it's systematically produced in the failure to think through the multicultural histories of Europe as part of the cosmopolitan vision otherwise promoted by many of its public intellectuals. It's produced by the failure to acknowledge the connected sociologies of empire and colonialism at the heart of Europe and European conceptions of citizenship and belonging. The problem, as I'll go on to suggest, is that such questions are usually organized within national frames rather than more appropriately within the frames of imperialism and empire. And through this talk, I question how taking seriously the broader histories of empire and colonialism would enable us to rethink these central concepts and provide more effective solutions. So in part, the argument that I'm making here is that the way in which we think about Europe is about a federation of nations. And the way in which we think about the past of each of these states is to think about the past as national. However, what I'll go on to argue is that the past of Europe is not a national past, it's an imperial past, both of the idea of Europe itself and also the states within it. And I'll expand more on what I mean here. Our contemporary political landscape is organized around the idea of the nation state. And if we think about the genealogy of where this idea of the nation state comes from, most scholars would argue that it comes from the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, and the history of the modern nation state is seen to begin with that treaty, and then it's further shaped by the American and French revolutions in the late 18th century. Within Europe, there are seen to be two routes to statehood. The first is the evolution of nation states within the boundaries of existing territorial states, such as presented to be the case amongst North and Western European states. And the second was in establishing a nation and then a state, as exemplified by the projects of Germany and Italy in the late 19th century. And then you have what is seen to be the subsequent formation of states in Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century. So within this genealogy, you then, this is then followed by what is seen to be the period of mass decolonization in the mid to late 20th century. And then you have the establishment of new post-colonial states. And a final moment in this history is presented as the secession of states from the orbit of the Soviet Union in the aftermath of its collapse in the late 20th century. So most social science operates with this particular genealogy of the emergence of nation states, first in Europe as a consequence of the Treaty of Westphalia, then with the American and French revolutions, and then spreading outwards. The issue that I have with this genealogy is that I find that there's an odd elision that posits a post-colonial state without addressing the processes of colonization itself as part of state formation. And second, that it posits territorial delimitations of statehood without addressing the much wider territorial claims of states. So what I mean here is that the period that is seen to give rise to the emergence of the modern state is precisely the period of colonial expansion that saw some European states consolidate their domination over other parts of the world. And yet this external domination is rarely theorized as a constitutive aspect of the modern state, which instead of being understood as an imperial state, which is what I would argue it empirically is, it's presented in national terms. And we continue this lie by talking about national histories of these states when the histories have actually been imperial. Now, whilst this is easily understood in the case of Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, and even Germany, I argue that this was also the case in terms of Scandinavian and Eastern European countries. And this is as a consequence of what 19th century German advocates called emigrationist colonialism. <coughs> Across the 19th century, 60 million Europeans, poor and unemployed Europeans, left their countries of origin to make new lives and livelihoods for themselves on the lands inhabited by others, 
Large-scale Polish emigration started in the period after the Franco-Prussian War and as a consequence of the policies of depolonization by the newly established German state. Peasants facing poverty and starvation moved to what was called the New World, and they were part of the process of settler colonialism that transformed the lands of native peoples into what we today call the United States of America. By the turn of the 20th century, at least 1.5 million Polish people had moved to the US, or what was to become the US, and occupied land there through processes of dispossession and the elimination of native peoples. If we're to take this colonial context seriously, then it would be quite straightforward to understand that the emergence of European states does not occur as a consequence of national projects or processes, but rather as the outcome of colonial and imperial ones. This is so even amongst those states which claim not to have been involved in the European project of colonialism, because unfortunately for them, even if colonialism wasn't a state project, their populations were part of emigrationist colonialism, and this needs to be reckoned with. There's hardly any consideration of how colonial relations of domination and subordination connected dispersed territories and populations within an imperial polity, nor of how a specific nation-state form of that polity only emerged as a consequence of decolonization. So in the same way as with standardly within the literature, it's presented that post-colonial states emerged as nation states as a consequence of decolonization processes, I would argue that we need to take that further and argue that the imperial state from which these countries were establishing their independence in order to become nation states, that that process of decolonization then also created nation states of those European states. Prior to the moment of decolonization, European states with colonies were not nation states. They were imperial states. So it's only after decolonization that Europe itself comes to have nation states. So in this way, I would suggest that European nation states today, for the most part, are post-colonial states. And yet European commentators refer only to decolonized states as post-colonial. Going back again to Habermas, we see that his association of multiculturalism with what he calls post-colonial immigrant societies demonstrates precisely the widespread but parochial understanding that limits the post-colonial to those others who migrate to Europe. So what I'm arguing here is that to the extent that we talk about the post-colonial, even among scholars of the standing of Habermas, he only sees the post-colonial in terms of those populations that come to Europe after the period of decolonization. They're called post-colonial immigrant societies. There's no understanding that Europe having been colonial and then gone through a forced process of decolonization by those states who chose independence from Europe is itself or does itself need to understand itself as post-colonial. And that failure to recognize how Europe itself is post-colonial is part of the problem that I'm wishing to address here. So what limiting the post-colonial to others does is render invisible the long-standing histories that connect those peoples with Europe and as European. And there's no recognition of the earlier movements of Europeans that establish the colonial as a condition now of the post-colonial. The issue here is the wholesale erasure of that external domination from the theorization of the modern state and its associated concepts such as citizenship. So effectively what I'm arguing is that because the way in which we understand the history of the state is to understand it in national terms, then all political concepts associated with the state, such as citizenship, we also delimit to national boundaries. But if these states were not national states, but were imperial states, then that distorts the way in which we think about these particular concepts in the present. And if we want to have more effective concepts, then we actually need to reconsider the histories that give shape to, to them. So what I argue is that a more, concept, more adequate conceptual understanding requires us to take seriously the imperial histories that were constitutive to the formation of modern states and their populations. Not to do so is not only an intellectual error, 
but it has profound consequences for the nature and possibilities of politics in the present. And so moving to the present, the crisis that has faced us most starkly in the daily reports of the media over the last few years is that of refugees fleeing war, persecution, and the devastating destruction of their homes and homelands. While many people would argue that any invocation of crisis should refer to those fleeing such devastation or to those trapped within it, the majority of our media commentators and politicians instead refer to the crisis facing Europe as we are called upon to aid these people and to aid them in fulfillment of our commitments made under international laws and treaties. Europe is the richest continent on the planet, riches implicated in large part by its imperial past, and yet it takes in the smallest proportion of the world's refugees. Developing countries host over 80% of the world's refugees. Europe takes about six. In the year in which Europe saw the most asylum applications, the worst year in the Syrian conflict that produced fatalities in the hundreds of thousands, in that year, the number of asylum applications constituted 0.25% of the population of Europe. If we add together the numbers of asylum applications that have been granted since 2015, we see that the increase in the total estimated population of Europe is about 0.31%. Could there be an, an empirical crisis of the magnitude claimed on the basis of such a marginal increase in the population of Europe? If a 0.31% increase in the population can really cause the sort of crisis that we see daily in our newspapers and hear from our politicians, then I'm afraid things are even worse for Europe than we might ever have imagined. All EU countries are signatories to both the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. This means that we're obligated by law, if not by moral conscience and our claimed common values, to accept people claiming refuge when they are fleeing conditions of war, violence, and persecution. Indeed, the cosmopolitan liberal order that seemed to define the project of Europe is founded on an explicit commitment to human rights. So if there is a crisis in Europe, it's a moral crisis associated with Europe's failure in the main to act in a manner consistent <laughs> with what are claimed as European values. Britain promised to take in 3,000 unaccompanied minors in 2016. To date, it's accepted 20. Poland was asked by the EU to take in 6,000 refugees as part of the transfer scheme in 2016. It's not taken in any. This has implications for the European project as a whole, and perhaps has served to undermine it through the facilitation of the forms of atavistic nationalism that we see dangerously on the rise around us. It's the colonial histories, as I've argued, of Europe that have produced its multicultural present. A multiculturalism that over the last five years, political leaders from Cameron to Merkel to Sarkozy have declared to have failed. What does it mean to say multiculturalism has failed when it's colonialism that created multicultural empires and then multicultural European societies? What does it mean to say multiculturalism has failed when post-colonial European societies continue to be empirically multicultural? What sort of politics does it legitimate? Perhaps the sort of politics that requires many of us, again, to have to assert our humanity, the value of our being beyond racialized or religious hierarchies. So how could a post-colonial sociology better help us to understand this present? How could the arguments I've made thus far about needing to recognize the colonial constitution of modern nation states help us in thinking about what's going on and what we might be able to do about it? The boundaries of the political community within Europe and the associated rights of citizenship and the right to have rights 
are usually imagined to be congruent with the territorial boundaries of the state as, de as defined in national terms. So the idea of the political community as a national political order has been central to European self-understanding and to standard social scientific accounts. And I have to say, in terms of the presentations that I've heard at the conference, this idea of a national past, national histories, national cultures, is what seemed to be the dominant way of understanding what European states were about. I want to take the example of Brexit here to illustrate what I think is going on. Because Brexit perhaps most sharply highlights the disingenuous revision of history to suit current politics. Because there's an absolutely misguided sense that the British past is national. And indeed, much of the rhetoric in the Brexit debates turns precisely on the question of reclaiming our national sovereignty. But Britain has never been a nation. It's always been an empire. Britain as a political entity came into being in 1707 through the act of union that brought together the kingdoms of England and Scotland. Both England and Scotland already had colonies prior to entering into that act of union. Once they'd entered into the act of union, they went on to establish the British Empire. The British Empire included Ireland as one of its first colonies and those in the so-called New World. And they went on to establish an empire that covered one quarter of the earth and governed over one fifth of its population, including by the 1920s over one half of the world's Muslims. As an empire, Britain was irredeemably multicultural, multi-ethnic and multi-religious. This imperial formation continued through into the late 20th century when decolonization led to the dismantling of empire and was accompanied by our simultaneous entry into the European Economic Community. The fact of joining the EEC and becoming part of a different transnational federation meant that in Britain, people never had to deal with what it meant to go from being a global empire to being a small state cooperating as an equal with other small states. So it's never had to properly account for the colonial past or to navigate that legacy in the present. One aspect of that legacy is what we're witnessing in terms of the attempts by the government to disenfranchise people of the Windrush generation who hadn't regularized their status. For those of you who don't know, there's been, well, I'll explain it in this way. So in um, 1948, India had gained its independence in 1947. Other parts of the empire were beginning the processes of decolonization. And as other places were decolonizing, India, for example, established citizenship laws in 1947. Britain at that point didn't have citizenship laws. It didn't have legislation in relation to citizenship. So it passed the British Nationality Act in 1948. And in the process, what this act did was it gave citizenship to everybody living within Britain and its colonies. The, the, the title was that you were a citizen of the UK and its colonies. At the same time, it gave citizenship to everybody who lived in a country that was now part of the Commonwealth that had been a former colony. And that citizenship was uh, Commonwealth citizenship. And that entitled you to all the rights that being a citizen of the UK and its colonies did. The right to come to Britain, to live in Britain, to work in Britain. So in 1948, the British government gave citizenship to an estimated population of 800 million people. Why did it do this, you might ask? Well, first, it wanted to maintain its sense of being a global power. The dismantling of empire was a political reality that it didn't particularly wish to face. And so by giving citizenship to this population, it, it enabled it to imagine a community that still was global. But perhaps more importantly, I don't think that people at that point believed that people from the colonies would make the return journey to the imperial metropole. As they began to do so, however, concerns were raised in Parliament about the consequences of what they called coloured immigration. This then led to the Commonwealth Immigration Acts of 62, 68 and 71, 
which were explicitly racialized acts in that they took citizenship rights away from darker peoples of empire, or now of the Commonwealth, but maintained the rights of their paler cousins. And it's this process of racially discriminatory disenfranchisement that's at the heart of the Windrush scandal, where people who have come to Britain from the Caribbean, but also other parts of the Commonwealth, and who came in the 1950s and 1960s, and for whatever reason, whether not having enough time, but probably more likely because of not having enough money, never regularized their status by applying for a British passport. Because at that point, you didn't need to have a British passport. You were a citizen. It's only because of the subsequent laws that have been passed that now require you to have a passport to demonstrate your identity. These are people who've been in Britain 40, 50 years, many of them are pensioners, and they're now being asked to produce documents that prove that they've been here, worked, paid income tax, and so on. All of this information the government already has. It has in its tax office, it has in its various offices, but it requires the individual to provide that information. Individuals don't necessarily keep pay slips going back 50 years. And so if they can't demonstrate that they've been citizens for the last 50 years, they're now being deported back to the Caribbean. So they came as British citizens. They're now not being recognized as British citizens and they're being forced to go back. If anybody's been ill, they go to hospital, they're sometimes asked to prove their citizenship status at the hospital prior to being treated. This doesn't happen to uh, white British people of a similar age who also may not have ever traveled outside of the country and therefore not have a passport. It's only asked of the darker citizens. And it's this fundamental inequality, which I would argue is at the heart of the British state and its institutions, and at the heart of its self-understanding of supposed good gov governance that is the legacy of empire. It's a legacy which, in common with other European colonial powers, fails to acknowledge the migration of European populations in settlements that help create European wealth, whilst now decrying the migration of other populations to Europe, most of them, over 90%, from former colonies, escaping the poverty that is their legacy of empire. So this is a history that's not just generally forgotten, but it's also erased in the histories that the European Union, and I would suggest many Europeans, tell about their own past. In answering the question of who is Europe, we need to address these mythologies. So if we think about the European Union itself, we see how scholarship on the historical evolution of European integration has been organized around a dominant narrative that sees the European Union as a project of peace. This was consolidated in 2012 with the award of the Nobel Peace Prize to the EU. This mythology effaces the history of European domination in the past, as well as exclusions of both territories and citizens in the present. As P.O. Hansen argues, for example, such an identification can only stand to the extent that violence in the European colonies is separated out as being of a different order to that occurring within the boundaries of Europe itself. And he points in particular to the Algerian War, 1954 to 62, which occurs at the same time that the EEC is being given institutional form, which resulted in the death of over a million people and engaged approximately half a million French troops. He argues that not even a sizable war for inside the European economic community has been able to impinge upon the notion of European integration as a symbol of peace. And what makes this more pointed is the fact that Algeria was actually part of the EEC. It entered the EEC in 1957 on the same basis as France. The only difference being that Algerian workers were not free to move between the member states, and nor were they to receive wages or social insurance at European rates. So in this way, we can see that the European project was both a colonial project and a racial one from the very outset, in that it inscribed racialized hierarchy in its very emergence by arguing for differential wages for Algerian workers. <laughs> 
The displacement of this violence from the narrative of the emergence of the European polity is a consequence of the disjunctive translation of identity, whereby France is seen to be European, Algeria is established as French, but it's not recognized as European. This maneuver enables violence in Algeria not to be recognized as occurring within the European polity, even when the war is one of independence from France and as such from the European project itself. In the process, the fiction of the substance of Europe as peaceable is maintained, as is the fiction of European boundaries, both in terms of its geography and its populations. As P.O. Hansen and Stefan Jonsson argue in their timely project Eurafrica, the post-war period that saw the negotiations that ultimately led to the establishment of the EEC was one in which parts of Africa and the common market were bound together in one imperial polity. Indeed, the negotiations for European integration, as they demonstrate, were predicated on the very idea, and I quote, of bringing Africa as a dowry to Europe. That is, at the time, when the negotiations were going on about establishing the EEC, it was believed that it was only through exploiting Africa's resources, its land, its labor, and its markets, that the European project would even have a hope of getting off the ground. So not only were the colonies, the African colonies of European states unquestionably, unquestioningly put at the service of the incipient European project, there was a stronger statement and again I quote from Hansen and Jonsson, that Europe's unification could succeed only if it was fashioned as a joint colonization of Africa. So here, whilst one of the ways in which, when telling the history of the EU, if colonialism is mentioned, one response by many Europeans is, oh, well, you know, some European countries had colonies, but the European Union was an attempt to move away from this sort of past, and we've left the colonies as part of the national histories of those states, and the European Union somehow stands above that past. But what we see by looking at the work of Hansen and Jonsson is that the very process of creating the European Union was predicated on a notion of colonizing African resources in order to enable this project to go ahead. So in this sense, it's not just that the original members of the EEC were all imperial formations. So that's the other thing to point to, to sort of stress at this point is that when we talk about the emergence of the European Union or the EEC as it was initially, we talk about it as the coming together of nation states to form a transnational federation. But if we look at the original members, none of them were national states. They were all at the point of emergence, imperial formations of one sort or another. The political boundaries of France included Algeria, as I've mentioned, as well as other colonies in Africa. Italy included parts of Somaliland, Belgium included the Congo, and the Netherlands included Suriname and a number of Caribbean islands. Luxembourg had been part of the German Zollverein and from 1921 was in a colonial economic union with Belgium. With the subsequent accession of Spain, Britain, and Portugal, the idea that it was nation states that were joining together is demonstrated as clear fiction. Given the extent of overseas territories, and populations that they brought with them. The European project then was established by the coming together of colonial and imperial states, not national states. And yet colonialism is rarely mentioned in discussions of it. Not taking into account the colonial constitution of European states within dominant discourses of the EU or discussions of European history and culture means that however cosmopolitan your understandings of the EU may be in orientation or intention, they nonetheless contribute significantly to the construction of narrow identities and policies. Narrow identities and policies that are mobilized by the atavistic nationalisms that one might otherwise decry in the present. Following decolonization and the formal end of empires, European states have purified their histories as national histories and imagined their political communities as composed of kith and kin, 
In this context, there is a refusal to share obligations to those who were previously dominated within their broader imperial political communities. This is the politics of selective memory that is currently playing out in Europe. Failing to recognize these imperial histories as the basis for the national states that now exist is precisely what enables some to argue for the rights of Europeans, of citizens, of white people, over the rights of others. But those others have histories that entitle them to be here. Not to recognize those histories and the associated rights is to play into the dangerous politics that is currently disfiguring our present. The claim that it is only Europeans who are entitled to rights is being made across the political spectrum. It's easily recognizable on the far right, but what do we have to say when such initiatives come from the left? when people talk about the need to protect our workers from the consequences of immigration, when they suggest that we need to respond to the legitimate concerns of those who want to see the borders closed to refugees. Asserting the legitimacy of the national state against globalization is an inadequate response to a history in which the nation state has been created through globalization. Globalization, or as it was formerly called, colonialism. In a situation of the general advantages of Europe, such advantages no longer deserve to be called rights. Rights that are not extended to others are privileges. And in this way, imperial inclusion, based on hierarchical and racialized domination, is reproduced as national, joint European exclusion reflecting earlier forms of domination and similarly racialized. And it's interesting that it's at this moment that Europe postulates the thought that rights are bounded and that its values perhaps are not universal. This is a relativism of privilege underpinned by a social science and humanities that fails to acknowledge its constitution in our shared colonial past. The question for us as scholars as we seek to work within our disciplines, and as citizens, as we navigate the politics of our time, is whose side are we on? This is not a partisan question, even though the taking of sides is inevitable. This is a question about our adherence to a universal now properly understood. The deportations had been happening for a while, but it was only refugees and asylum seekers initially. People whose right to be here was anyway tenuous, at best irregular, at worst illegal. The irregularity of presence was then extended backwards so that those who had arrived along legal routes but hadn't sorted out their paperwork were also put at threat. Still, those people were other, strangers who had come to live among us. Who were we though? And perhaps more importantly, who were we becoming? The papers of those who looked suspect were being checked at underground stations. Bank accounts of those with objectionable associations were being frozen and people's money confiscated. The language of dehumanization was so prevalent and naturalized that there was no public consequence for labeling groups of people as cockroaches or for calling for a final solution to be enacted upon others. When do the isolated incidents that happen to others aggregate such that they change the conditions of all our lives? Perhaps none of it should have been tolerated, but we did tolerate each small act of unkindness and where were we now? Even as those who move are harassed, oppressed, and persecuted, the solution for some of us continues to be to move. We escape persecution to survive, and those movements generate further difficulties. Different difficulties, no doubt, but displacements of self and of those among whom we seek to reside. From living 
to residing, to existing? Is each just another aspect of the human condition? Or is one its fulfillment and the other's diminished versions? It had just seemed aberrant then. Sorry, can I help you, she asked. She had been reading the paper on the way back from the newsagent and missed what had been said. She turned back to the car with her apology. A young lad, his torso out of the rear passenger window, looking back at her, let rip a series of expletives. The language was indistinct, but the tone and gesture spoke clearly enough. She wasn't wanted here. She should go home. Go home. How many iterations of that once original catchphrase had there been? A few years ago, the Home Secretary and now Prime Minister had decided to get the slogan painted on the sides of vans to be driven around London. Go home. An echo of the thud of fascist boots on darker bodies in cities across the country two decades earlier. Amplifying in turn Powell's blood-soaked rhetoric of the unbelonging of the immigrant descended. It should be noted, however, that he had had few difficulties with the white immigrant descended. It was only the children and grandchildren of darker citizens that exercised him. History had thrust British citizenship upon her. Calling herself British was not an act of pride, but of an adequate reckoning with the past that had produced her as such. How does one know when to leave prior to being deported? There are no signs except in retrospect. There were no snatch squads in the city centre. Or if they were, they weren't there for us. Not yet. There was no arbitrary detention, except for those for whom there was. But it wasn't us, yet. Thank you so much for that inspiring and amazing talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. How long do we have? Can you just... Half an hour. So, anybody like to go first? Thank you very much for your inspiring words and also for the fragments that you brought at the beginning and at the end. Um, so, the question would be very strange. What do we do? Thank you. Well, we said never again, didn't we? So we have to be aware of the situation we're facing. And we have to do what we need to do in relation to it. We cannot allow what happened 70 years ago to happen again. And each and every one of us who believes themselves not to be a fascist, has to act in not being a fascist. It's not enough to say that you're not a fascist. You have to be an anti-fascist. And what that will require of us in different places and at different times will be different things. But we have to act. Uh, thank you for that amazing talk. It was indeed inspiring. Um, this may be a question coming very much out of the British context. Uh, others may see parallels in their own countries. But you mentioned um, that there is um, a move, I think, amongst people who might define themselves as liberal or even left liberal. And you mentioned Clinton's recent intervention to talk about the necessity of, of listening to legitimate concerns. And I've noticed, particularly in the debate, uh, in the English-speaking world, this increasing uh, tendency to argue that um, difference in and of itself produces, uh, as I think you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, um, an adverse reaction that is in and of itself problematic. People somehow naturally have a, a negative reaction to, uh, to difference. 
um, and that somehow we've all got to accept that now because somehow you know, multiculturalism was kind of a uh, an, uh, delusion. Um, so wh what do you think our strategies are for, for combating that kind of discourse, coming as it is not necessarily from the right, mm -hmm. but actually from liberals or maybe, maybe left liberal positions? Thank you for that. I mean, I think, so this question of the legitimate concerns of the white working class is something that's been phrased in those terms within Britain, but I think it's also part of... German discourse and other discourses across Europe in terms of presenting a particular sort of argument whilst trying to make <coughs> other things which are deemed to be problematic palatable. So how can we present an argument that we know to be racist but present it in a way that suggests that actually we're not really being racist, we're just concerned about other people who haven't been taken into, uh, taken into consideration in various ways. I think the difficulty is, okay, so what we need to do is think about the history that produces the current situation that we're talking about. So you mentioned Britain. So if I take the British example, it's in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that people from the darker Commonwealth started coming to Britain, and they began to live there, work there, and so on. And in the 50s and 60s, there were no laws against racial discrimination. So you could discriminate against people on the basis of their race, whether it was for housing, whether it was for employment, whether it was for entering leisure centres, things like this. And what occurred was that at that point as well, Britain was largely unionised, but what people don't often realise is that the unions often operated a colour bar. If you wanted to get a job in a factory or at, on the tube, the, the underground, you had to be a member of the union. The union facilitated your entry into the, the workplace in that sense. But the union operated a colour bar. It didn't allow black or brown people to enter the union, and therefore they couldn't get work in factories or in the underground or on the buses and, and so on. And this continued through till the, 19, the late 1960s when eventually the Race, uh, Race Relations Act was passed that made discrimination on the basis of race uh, illegal. So what you had in the 1950s and 60s was a situation where you had good working class jobs, which were largely almost predominantly occupied by white people, and uh, precarious work, non-unionised, flexible, casual, which was then occupied by black and brown workers. With the Race Relations Act, immediately afterwards, or a decade afterwards, you had the uh, election of Margaret Thatcher, who destroyed the unions, broke also the colour bar in a particular aspect, but that was also already done with the Race Relations Act. But in breaking the unions, what, sh what occurred was that the conditions of white working class people moved down it became on a par with the conditions that black and brown people were already in. So the thesis that's presented, how that's being interpreted, is the decline of the white working class. And you can say, okay, empirically, yes, there has been a decline, but it's not a decline, it's actually not even a decline to the conditions that most black and brown people continue to work in within Britain at the moment. So whilst there is a decline, that decline is relative, it's certainly not absolute, and there's a whole layer of people who still occupy the position below where the white working class is. If that's the case, why is our focus on the issue of decline and not actually on addressing the real problem, which is precarious, non-unionised, casualised work? If we say what we're concerned with are the economic conditions within which workers are working, then let's address the conditions. But we don't have a movement within Britain, even these left liberals who sort of go on about the plight of the white working class. If you say, well, one way to address this is to have higher taxes, to have better regulation, have workplace laws and so on that address the conditions of employment, none of them are arguing on that basis for actually addressing the conditions. They're just mobilising a sentiment in relation to, oh, well, white people shouldn't be in this situation. But it's really OK for black and brown people to be in that situation because we're not even talking about that. So I think that's something that's going on within Germany as well. You've had Wolfgang Strick, 
talk about the movement and this idea of the legitimate concerns of the white working class Germans and they feel left behind in relation to all this emphasis that's being put on refugees and migrants. And again, I would go back to the fact that even though Germany and Sweden are the countries that have taken in the most refugees over the current crisis, the numbers coming into the European Union as a whole are 0.31%. The problems that the white working class might be facing have got very <coughs> little to do with the refugees who have come. They're to, do with more, they're to do with the forms of neoliberalism that we have voted in, rather, through the governments that we've elected. We've elected governments that have sought to cut the conditions of workers. So it's our responsibility to address that. So I think that that's an argument that absolutely needs to be tackled head on. It's, it's a very, very dangerous argument because it turns the focus away. It seeks to make legitimate something that's actually illegitimate. And I do just want to say one other thing in relation to this, because there was a book that came out, because the arguments are the same in America, in the US, and a book came out a couple of years ago, Ali Hochschild's uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, in which, again, she goes to uh, one of the southern states, and she interviews white Tea Party voters to find out, you know, why is it that they're now thinking of voting for Trump? So the book is published before Trump is elected. But once Trump is elected, this book is seen to explain why Trump was elected. And she goes and, vis uh, and interviews the these uh, working class white voters in Louisiana, I think it is, and discovers that they feel she has this anecdote. You know, it's like they've been standing in a line and the American dream is just there. They're on their way to the American dream. But then suddenly, just as the dream is in, in sort of touching distance, then suddenly you have affirmative action and black people cut in line in front of them, women cut in line in front of them, all these other people cut in line in front of them and the American dream seems further away and so they feel left behind as a consequence of that. And so therefore she presents their concerns as legitimate concerns. If that was the entirety of the story, you might have some discussion about it. But what she doesn't address is that for 200 years, the US was a society organized on slavery and then racial segregation. Affirmative action to the extent that it exists was not about promoting African Americans over white Americans, but rather about addressing the 200 years of history Whereas these white Americans were making their way towards the American dream, there had been a wall blocking African Americans from even being part of that line. <coughs> so the only way you could talk about the concerns of white Americans as legitimate is if you think racialized segregation is legitimate. If you don't believe in racialized segregation as legitimate, then there is no legitimacy of the concerns of white workers because there are no concerns that white workers have that aren't shared by workers of all backgrounds. There's a, sorry, there's a question that, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, Gaminda. Um, thank you so much for that. Having heard you speak before and read your work, I've been really excited all day um, to hear you speak again. So it's really great um, to have you here. Um, I was really struck by uh, that, that kind of careful deconstruction you give of this idea of the nation state and, and the kind of critique you have that actually we're really attached to the idea of nation when actually it should be about kind of imperial state. And I've been having conversations with colleagues recently where we've kind of been talking about the same thing within heritage studies and saying, you know, we, we try and get away from the national and we sometimes do that by trying to talk about objects as having complex histories, but you kind of inevitably get drawn back to the nation again and again. So I suppose mine's a kind of two-part question. I suppose it's kind of a one of method, methodology, you know, where I'm asking you this as someone that's not a heritage studies person per se, but I, would, I guess I'd say, where do we start? Or, or how do we get away from that idea of the nation when we're looking at kind of history and heritage? And then secondly, given how intrinsically attached people are generally to nationhood and particularly now in the age of Brexit and right-wing populism, how do we encourage 
general populations as well to get away from that. Okay. Um, how do we start methodologically? I mean, in a way, I don't know, but you could sort of look at the British Museum. And if we understood the British Museum actually as a national museum and then interrogated the objects in it, it would be quite clear that Britain wasn't a nation but an empire because the objects in the British Museum come from all over the world and they don't just come from all over the world, they were stolen from all over the world. So there could be a way of actually interrogating the objects and not use euphemisms such as complex histories, but actually talk about them having been stolen, that, this is, that much of the heritage industry is based on theft. So if it acknowledges theft as central to the establishment of museums and galleries and so on, then how would that, just acknowledging that fact, how would that change the way in which one relates to one's heritage? in particular sorts of ways. And the thing about the sort of rise of nationalism, I mean, one of the things that I would want to stress is that I think that these are very much elite projects. You know, this is not the natural emotions of individuals on the streets. These are orchestrated in particular sorts of ways. And political elites can either work to mitigate against those sorts of aspects, or they can choose to exacerbate them. So if we think about the 60s, 70s, and 80s even, there was a relative commitment by the political elite within Europe to acknowledge its past, its recent past, not its longer imperial past, but at the very least to acknowledge the past of the mid-20th century, which had resulted in the Holocaust and the way in which the politics of race within the continent had created such catastrophe to take responsibility to not mobilize race in such a way as to enable something like that to occur again. So we had a period of relative equanimity, of relative peace, if you want to use those terms, where people weren't racist in the street, at least in Britain, in the way in which they perhaps might have been in the early 70s or are again now. So I don't believe that in the period between the early 70s and now, people were just suppressing these ancient hatreds. So I don't believe that there's this idea that difference causes us to hate each other, because I don't believe in the idea of there being pre-existing differences. All differences are political and are politically created. There is no difference that exists that divides us that isn't politically created. So if we can create political division, we can also create political unity and what it seems is the political elite and here it's not just in terms of party politicians but I would say the media very much so in giving voice to and so I'm sort of slightly concerned about the film as well in terms of who is being given voice here there were no black and brown Europeans we exist we exist because of the histories that you produced <coughs> and so to erase our presence constantly, continuously, is to legitimise the idea of Europe as white. And Europe's never been white, because European states have never been white. European states have always sought to extend beyond their boundaries within what we understand to be Europe. So to erase that history is part of, I would say, the far-right project. And I'm sure you don't wish to be part of that far-right project, but that's why I'm pushing you to think about what are you legitimating in the presentation of who you think Europe is. Yeah, thanks. That was a, a really uh, rich and challenging paper, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, I fully support the, the kind of underlying sentiment. So my question really has to do with someone who, myself, who identifies emotionally as European and was absolutely, you know, unconsolable the, the, the night after the referendum, who has in some sense identified deeply as European and has always thought of Europe as complex, open-ended and, and multivalent. I wonder whether the problem is, is that we use Europe as a kind of catch-all, as a sort of, um, you know, an, an, a nullifying term that, that um, kind of has has run out of energy or meaning, and maybe the problem, or maybe I should phrase it this way as a question, do you think the very notion of European identity itself um, 
is something that that can survive this this kind of provocation that you're you're giving us. Is there a a different kind of Europeanness that that can emerge, which is as as affective as you know uh, um, you, you know in the context of what you're talking about, is there a kind of cosmopolitanism that, that is not necessarily a kind of, you know, a cosmopolitan, European cosmopolitanism implicated in, in the colonial project, or at least not so blind to it, so mm -hmm. unwilling to speak of it? I mean, I think the European identity is recoverable, and it's recoverable to the extent that it repairs the past that it produces. So, one can't address the legacies of colonialism by simply wishing that they didn't exist. And in many ways, the idea, certainly in this post-war period, of the creation of European identity has been on an absolute disavowal of the past that's produced Europe, both in terms of producing each state of Europe as well as producing the European project itself. And so until there's an adequate reckoning with the history that's produced the wealth of Europe, then I think a European identity will always revert to the tendencies that it's demonstrating at the moment. So if you want to say, who is Europe? It was the first film we saw. It was Dresden. That's what Europe is. But there's the possibility for Europe to be other than that. But to be other than that, it has to recognize the history that produces it. If it doesn't, then there is no hope. Um, thank you to take my question. First of all, thank you very much for the quality of your lecture. Uh, I'm French and I'm really sensitive to the part related to Algeria war, as my grandfather was part of it. My question is, um, uh, at the beginning of November, on November 4th exactly, there was a referendum for New Caledonia. New Caledonia is a, a French territory and they had a referendum asking about the sovereignty. Uh, if they wanted to become independent from France or not. Uh, I think 81% of people voted there and uh, they voted to remain part of France at 57%. Um, and it, was, it has been colonized by France more than a, a century ago. So how would you translate this result into who is Europe, mm -hmm. basically? Well, I mean, one way to think about that result is to think that France has not paid any reparations to any of its former colonies to enable them to exist as viable entities. So there's no way for New Caledonia to exist economically outside of the benefits that it currently gets. That's one thing that we in Britain haven't quite realised, that actually, is it viable to be outside of the European economic union or not, but in New Caledonia they recognise that. And I just, so let me say one other thing in terms of this, because what a lot of the debates currently focus on, particularly in relation to refugees and migration, <coughs> is this idea that, you know, that somehow the wealth of where we are has been generated and established on the basis of our labour our resources, or that of our ancestors, and therefore, who are you to come here from outside and seek a claim of what we have built? Let's take France. France has the exact same narrative. France also had colonized Haiti, Saint-Domingue, alongside a whole number of other sort of Caribbean and African countries, but Haiti was one of the most sort of uh, resonant, if you like, in part because when the island that, that France colonized was called Saint-Domingue, and there in the 1790s, there were revolts and revolutions against French colonialism, to the extent that in 1804, a new independent state was created called Haiti. It had thrown out the French, it had been a revolution of self-emancipation because these people had also been enslaved. They weren't just colonized, but enslaved and made to work on plantations. Haiti had provided, it was the largest market for the sale of French goods. It produced something like one half of the world's coffee and a third of its sugar, the profits of which all went to the French state. And it was, you know, so after the revolution, 
France then organized a blockade, an economic blockade against Haiti to stop it trading with any other country. Germany, France, the US, the fledgling US, all agreed to this economic blockade so that within 20 years, Haiti went bankrupt. And so it had to go to France and ask France to lift the blockade. France said, well, yes, OK, we will lift the blockade, but we want to be compensated. And so Haiti had to agree. So France sent auditors to Haiti in 1835, who valued all the property in Haiti that they had lost as a consequence of the Haitians emancipating themselves. They also valued each individual human being because having been enslaved, those people had been the property of the French. France asked compensation from Haiti of 150 million gold francs in 1835 for the temerity of having freed themselves from enslavement and colonization. Haiti had to agree. It spent the next century paying off that debt, that coerced debt to France. Just to put this into perspective, at the time of the Haitian Revolution, because Haiti had been so financially important to France, and it was in the middle of fighting the Napoleonic Wars at that time and needed cash to continue to do so, France ended up having to sell Louisiana to the fledgling US. Louisiana at the time isn't just the state of Louisiana as we now know it, its borders went north of Canada and south of Mexico, so it was the whole middle of the US as we now know it. That was sold to the 13 states for 80 million gold francs. And Haiti, this tiny island, was being asked to pay 150 million. It only finished paying off that debt in about 1922, by which time it had paid to France the equivalent in today's money of 21 trillion US dollars. So when you think about the wealth that France has, whose labor has contributed to the wealth that France has, whose resources have contributed to the wealth that France has, what acknowledgement is there of the labor lives and resources of the Haitians who have actually built the French welfare state? And how does France now get to deny people fleeing war, persecution and violence entry because it's our welfare state, we built it up? And this isn't just France, this is Britain, this is Germany, this is most of Western Europe. And it's most of Eastern and Northern Europe as well through emigrationist colonialism. The ability of Poles, of, of Ukrainians, of Scandinavians, <laughs> Swedes and others to go to what becomes the US, to take land there from native peoples, kill native peoples, take their land, build lives for them, and then send money back as remittances to help build up the economy back at home. So there's no way in which Central and Eastern Europe isn't also implicated in the colonial project of Europe. The whole wealth of this continent is built on the lives and resources of others. When will Europeans acknowledge that and start addressing the implications of that acknowledgement? Uh, hello, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was really interesting. And I wanted to touch upon what you said about the uh, sort of Central Europe also taking part uh, in the colonial process. And I think that general narrative and the general discussion about colonialism and post-colonialism is very different in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And so I think that in Eastern Europe, there is very often this tendency to think that we have never oppressed other nations, we have always been oppressed. And so I think these arguments about that we should accept refugees because we've, they come from countries that have very, for a long time been colonized by, by Western Europe, these arguments are actually taken and reversed, sort of, and so that people will say, yes, exactly, like France colonized Africa, Germany colonized Africa, they should take their responsibility right now and take these people to their countries. But we, from Poland, we have nothing to do with that. So I think in Poland, very often, this, the arguments that you use to sort of make us accept refugees would be exactly reversed. Mm 
And it's very difficult, I think, to come with a narrative that would be post-colonial and somehow make people understand that Europe is a, you know, like a general concept that has been built upon discrimination of other nations and that Poland as well has taken part in it. And I think in, in general, in Central Europe, this post-colonial discourse is very often taken by the right and not by the left mm -hmm. to speak about what I just said, that uh, we have always an, been imposed, like we have always been oppressed by other nations. And right now there is Europe that wants to impose on us the refugees quotas or other things. So um, while I agree with many things that you say, I think it's very difficult and very different in this part of, the, of Europe to talk about these issues. <coughs> So I, th I think that's absolutely right, but I would have two responses to that. One is that nobody forced these countries to be part of Europe. So if you're going to join Europe and you want to share in the benefits of what it means to be in the European Union, you also have to take on board the responsibilities of what it means to be in the European Union. So in that sense, you can't have European enlightenment without also taking up the consequences of European enslavement. The histories of Europe are common. And if you want to be part of the project, then you accept that. Secondly, I would say that partly the argument around immigrationist colonialism that I was making points precisely to the fact that these countries which claim not to have colonial pasts actually do have colonial pasts. And they have them through the facilitation of their populations to move to what Weber called free soil. But this was not free soil. There were populations living on this land. These were populations who had to be annihilated in order for that land to come into European possession. So in terms of Hungary, two million <coughs> Hungarians moved from Hungary to what we now call America in the, 18th, in the 19th century. And they, that's more than, that was like one fifth of the population. They didn't just go and then forget about the Hungarians who remained behind in Hungary. They built their homesteads, they built their companies, they made their lives and their money, and they sent that money back to invest back into Hungary and enable Hungary to develop in particular sorts of ways. In 1956, after the uh, uprising, the number of refugees from Hungary who were taken in by the rest of Europe, there was an acceptance that people escaping Hungary in 1956 ought to be recognised as refugees and ought to be taken care of. So Hungary accepts that, but now, and it's, you know, so in a sense, I think that there is, that I'm not saying that the histories of colonialism are the same across every European state. I absolutely accept there were some countries who went out and instituted forms of formal colonialism, Britain, France being two of the more extreme cases prior to that, Spain and Portugal, but also Germany and Italy had particular forms. Within Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, so including Scandinavia in relation to this, where there's a <laughs> sense that these countries didn't participate in formal colonialism, whilst their states didn't, their populations did. And their populations were often facilitated by associations set up by the state. So in Sweden, for example, you have Swedish associations for the welfare of emigrants. So as people were leaving, the Swedish state would give them aid to leave and set up new lives for themselves in the, 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 in the Midwest. And remember when these populations go, America is still really just the 13 colonies on, on the eastern seaboard. The process to actually create America across the whole continent is a process that's facilitated by the forms of settler colonialism of which Central and Eastern and Northern Europeans were an absolute integral part because they weren't given land in the places that were already settled, in the states that were already the US. They had to make their livelihoods on the frontier, on the frontier which meant fighting Native Americans and taking their land. So they were actively part of that process of settler colonialism. And if we don't take that seriously, we don't recognize how the state has imperial form even if it doesn't have a colony straightforwardly. So that's what I'm pointing to, and that's a history that I think 
here in Europe that we don't know, we don't talk about the fact that 60 million poor Europeans left in the 19th century to make better lives for themselves. These were economic migrants. And yet we have such a discourse of hostility against economic migrants in the present. So if we could understand our history, we might understand the need for a kinder, gentler politics in the present and not give in to this idea of legitimate concerns. Um, <clears throat> one more question, which uh, I think would try to challenge your, your main thesis, which I hope will make your explanation more interesting to us rather than praising your lecture, which is very interesting, by the way. I think your explanation to the question which was just uh, asked fails to address the, the fact that if you look at a country like Poland, then 90% of the, give and take, 90% of the population were in fact exploited by the 10%. And this process is, was called by some people internal colonization. So I think the example of Hungary doesn't quite apply to Poland. Poles also emigrated, but they were not exploiting the natives in North America. They were not chasing the Indians. They would mostly supply the labor force in big growing American cities or in Western Europe. So the case of Poland is a case of people who suffered suppression and yet are refusing to accept the other who is suffering some sort of oppression, economic, political. And, and the paradigm of colonization, I think, fails to uh, explain that. Secondly, if you look at a country like you mentioned a few times, Syria, there's basically give and take um, six countries who are fighting war there. Some are fighting proxy war, some are fighting hot war. There's Turkey, Russia, Iran, United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, you can continue probably counting. And again, if you look at United States refusing to accept any immigrants, mm -hmm. they are very far, but they can easily afford that, but they said zero. Russia, closer, zero. Turkey, who was an imperial power in the past, is accepting huge numbers. Actually, they only countries who are accepting immigrants in huge, huge numbers are poor neighboring countries like Lebanon and Jordan. Iran, who could afford some sympathy and who was also an oppressed country, it, it had a very distant history of, of empire, but very distant, but recent history is a history of suppression by the colonial European powers not really taking any immigrants and immigrants. And also Syrians do not want to go to Iran because Iran is Shiite and they are Sunnis. So I think it's another factor that is not really linked to explaining this phenomenon of, of the wave of immigration, which is linked to imperialism or, or lack of imperial experience in the past. Could you p perhaps try to address these? Uh, Concerns. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I think in relation to the issue of Syria, so if I deal with that first, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. The majority of people who are fleeing the war in Syria end up in neighboring <coughs> countries. I mean, Lebanon has taken in, I think, the most number of, of, of uh, refugees. It's over a million. And this is with Lebanon having a population of four, 4.5 million prior to this. So now one in five of the population in Lebanon is a refugee. And so that's 20% compared to the 0.3% that we've taken in Europe. I accept that Russia hasn't taken and other countries haven't taken, but in a sense, Europe is a continent that in its recent institutional form founded itself on a commitment to human rights. It calls itself cosmopolitan. The idea of cosmopolitan Europe is the ideology that gives substance to the union that would otherwise just be an economic union. So it claims to have values that take what Europe is beyond the simple economic federation. Those values are a commitment to the rule of law, democracy, religious tolerance, and a commitment to international rights and treaties. So it's in the context of what Europe claims to be 
that I argue it's a moral crisis for it not to accept the refugees, which it, in its own self-understanding, claims to be the substance of who it is. And also the fact that Europe is the richest continent on the planet, and it takes in less than 5% of the whole of the world's refugees. I find that quite extraordinary. Going back to the... I, you know, so again, like I said before, I'm not trying to say that the that all relations within Europe were the same. I absolutely accept what you're saying, that there were modes of oppression and domination within Europe itself. And in fact, the uh, establishment of Germany in the 1870s is one of the fundamental pushes for numbers of Polish people to go to the Americas precisely because of the waves of depolonization that the German government at that time does in the eastern borders and so on in order to push ethnic Germans to those lands to populate them and push pe Polish peasants out of those lands and so on. And also there were a number of famines within Europe which also pushed people out. So it was these sort of hierarchical forms of oppression and domination that occurred politically within Europe. But Europe also suffered famines. The biggest Swedish migration, for example, occurs as a consequence of the 1880 famine, where hundreds and, you know, tens of thousands of people leave. All I'm saying, and similarly with the, the Irish famine, which was produced as a consequence of British colonial rule in Ireland in the 1840s, one in nine of the population dies, and about two in nine of the population emigrate at that time. And again, they go to establish the US. So it's not to suggest that people don't have reasons for leaving and that those reasons are well-intentioned, but if we can accept that in terms of our past, why do we have such difficulty in making the argument for accepting others who are fleeing famine, war, destruction in the present today? So we think it's quite legitimate that at a time of crisis within Europe, that poor, unemployed, starving Europeans traveled across the Atlantic to make new lives and livelihoods on the land of others. But somehow, when we're involved in the debates in the present, our focus is on securitization, on fortress Europe, on a failure to acknowledge in any way whatsoever <coughs> that the ability of Europe to be what it is rests precisely on the European past that is often responsible for producing those conflicts. And one last thing I would say in relation to Syria and the situation of refugees in, as a whole is that if we don't want refugees, fine, I'm happy to accept that, that we don't want them. Then tell our governments to stop selling weapons because it's the sale of those weapons which produce the wars that create the refugees. There is no natural phenomenon of the refugee. Every refugee is produced, and to a large extent, they're produced because our governments sell arms to countries that they ought not to sell. So if you don't want refugees, stop the arms industry or do something else in relation to that. Until we're prepared to take responsibility for the actions of our governments in that respect, we've got no right to stop people. In fact, we have commitments that we have signed in international law that we will take people. So we can't have it both ways. You can either have European values and live up to them, or just decide actually, you know what, it was a nice idea, but we'd rather be a dictatorship. But be honest. What do you want? Who do you want to be? Who do we want to be? We have time for just one last question. There's been somebody waiting for a long time in the front row, so we'll, we'll let that person have their turn. I would like to thank you very much uh, for what you are doing, uh, for your courage, because it requires a lot of courage uh, to speak of things with people don't want to hear and see. And I was also thinking um, how about this uh, uh, challenge, how we can change the way that people think about refugees. And I think that this is really a huge task because we have to get to the basics like education. So I, for example, I find our education in 
in Poland, for example, but uh, I assume that it's in many European schools that it's mostly very Eurocentric, that we don't uh, learn, don't hear about achievements or history of other regions of the world. And so our perception of other continents or other peoples is very, you know, narrow, very uh, pan-European, like um, Europocentric. Um, and also, as we are in the Poland uh, Museum, and this museum highlights the history of Polish Jews, and also the uh, big part is about Holocaust. Um, I was thinking also of um, the genocides that, so many genocides that took place uh, in uh, the history of humanity. And you, you, you mentioned this phrase, never again. And I find it very um, sad and very unfair that we don't remember about other genocides, and this involves those um, those colonized nations that they like. I think that um, like many people in Poland have never heard of the genocide in Congo, for example. So uh, I. If, if you could comment on, on that, I, I would be very grateful. Thank you. Okay. So I think one of the ways is to think about the frame within which we locate histories. And what I've argued for strongly is this idea of connected sociologies. And that's an argument to think that if we think we know about something, if we took a step back and broadened our horizon a little bit, would the analysis that we originally made still stand if we acknowledge these broader connections? And one of the things that perhaps we need to think about is the way in which our understanding of the Holocaust is presented often as an aberration of modernity, as a deviant form of modernity. So using the work of Zygmunt Bauman, who's one of the classic thinkers, who argues for the need to think about the Holocaust as an aberration. But what if it wasn't an aberration? And if we stood back and recognized that the, modern, that the modernity that we're talking about was a modernity that was actually based on coloniality, such that the emergence of the modern world isn't something that occurs as a consequence of European achievements, but actually occurs as a consequence of European colonization, where that colonization involves genocides in other parts of the world. So the Herrera Nama people were effectively exterminated in Southwest Africa in 1905. The very same generals who were responsible for the extermination of the Herrera Nama people came back and were part of the Nazi army in the 1930s. The very same people. And yet, when we talk about the Holocaust, we very rarely situate it in the context also of the Herrera Nama genocide. There are some great scholars doing good work on this. Jürgen Zimmerer in Germany is one such scholar who's seeking to think about those sorts of connections. But there's also the Bengal famine. Three million people were killed as a consequence of the British public policy in India in 1943. So three million people killed as a consequence directly of public policy in India, at the same time as you have six million Jews being killed as a consequence of public policy in Germany. And yet we somehow don't make those connections. And these things in the Tasmania, the Americas, New Zealand, all of this, if we could understand that within a frame, then it's not to say that each instance is the same, but we can see that there are connections. And those connections point us to what we call as European modernity. And what I've argued within my work more generally is a need to understand European modernity, not as the emergence of the modern, but rather as the emergence of the colonial modern, because it's colonialism that creates the world within which we live. And until we recognize that and acknowledge it and deal with the legacy that it's left us, we're not going to be in a position to address the many problems that face us effectively enough.
I believe we've run out of time. I'm sure you'll agree that this has been extremely thought-provoking and very timely uh, into the discussions we've had here over the last two days. So it just remains for me to ask you to thank our speaker and also the museum and their staff who've been so wonderful in hosting many of us in the last few days and um, putting on this event for a wider audience tonight. So please show your appreciation. Thank you.